All right, so here is a research paper published by NASA, and it credits T. H. Skopinski and Katherine Johnson. It was written at the Langley Research Center, and it was written in September 1960. That's a year before Alan Shepard would become the first American in space, and before John Glenn would become the first American to orbit the Earth. The legacy of people like Katherine Johnson has helped to bring a lot of attention to the work done at NASA around this time, calculating how to put people up in space and how to bring them back down safely. The movie Hidden Figures especially highlighted the role of human computers in that work. But until now, I never really knew what that work would have looked like. I knew that Katherine Johnson's work, as shown in the movie, had something to do with orbital mechanics or analytic geometry but I was curious to know what the actual calculations and equations were, so that's why I went looking through the archives to find the actual documents. This is the first report that officially includes Catherine's name on the cover page, but it's not the first report she worked on. It's called The Termination of Azimuth Angle at Burnout for Placing a Satellite Over a Selected Earth Position. Let's go through some of the terms. The azimuth angle is measured from north and is the angle that you're pointing when you launch a rocket. Often it is limited by safety, we don't really want to launch rockets over populated areas or over houses, and so if you're launching you often want to have your azimuth angle such that you're going to launch out over the ocean. And burnout refers to the shutoff of the rocket engine. So after the burnout point, the orbital parameters are essentially locked in. And we can then just work with Newton's laws and other equations to find out where it's going to be. Because the azimuth angle at launch will affect where the satellite is going to end up after a certain number of orbits, this paper is trying to find out what launch azimuth angle you would need in order to end up at a selected Earth position after a set number of orbits. So say you want your astronaut to splash down in a certain region on Earth so that you can go and retrieve them. Well, the math in this paper is working out what you would need to do at launch and able to ensure that. They start by listing out a bunch of symbols. We have things like the semi-major axis and the eccentricity relating to the shape of the elliptical orbit. And we have the inclination angle of the orbital plane, and some of the parameters make reference to the perigee location, which is the point when the satellite is closest to the center of the Earth. It says here that if we know the initial conditions of speed, radial distance, and elevation angle at burnout, those will all determine the orbital characteristics of a satellite. So going on to work out a way to relate all of these parameters, they start with a bit of elementary orbital mechanics, for which they reference an introduction to celestial mechanics, published in 1914. These are all derivations working towards that ultimate relationship between the azimuth angle and the longitude and latitude that we wish to land at. These calculations were done by hand, likely by Katherine Johnson herself, but then it says here that the results for both cases are then compared with the results obtained by a method of a three degree of freedom calculation performed on an IBM 704 electronic data processing machine. This would be around the time that NASA got its very first computers, its IBM machines, which would have been huge and taken up an entire room and very difficult to use. They go on to present two example orbit calculations, one for a satellite that is launched westward and one for a satellite launched eastward, just to show that this method is not limited by the direction of launch. This page here is a summary of all of the equations that were derived and that will be useful in the calculation. And it actually involves a bit of an iterative procedure. Because we don't initially know anything about the orbital angle or the time it takes to get to a certain position, we just have this first approximation for the time it's taken to get to a selected point. We can feed that approximation into another equation and that value into another until we start to see some convergence in the values we're getting for the angle. 
After we're happy with this much, we can then finally feed the parameters into an equation to find the azimuth angle and the inclination angle, telling us what we need to launch the satellite. There's also a mention of oblateness effects because the Earth is not perfectly spherical, and this oblateness is taken into account with small modifications to the latitude and longitude values after the first iteration. And these are the exact equations here that Katherine Johnson would have been calculating in her role as a computer. But for this paper, she also had a lot to do with deriving them in the first place. In 1960, no woman at NASA had ever had her name included on a report. Katherine Johnson worked on this report with Ted Skopinski, and their supervisor encouraged Skopinski to finish the report and just put his name on it before going away on a trip to Houston. But Ted said, Catherine should be the one to finish it. She's done most of the work anyway. And so it became the first of 26 reports to include Catherine's name. If you take a look at these photos, you might notice these calculator looking devices on people's desks. And these were mechanical calculating aids. Here is a video from YouTube of a restored one and showing the kind of process that it uses. There's no electronics in one of these, but they can do arithmetic like addition and subtraction quite easily and through a bit more of a convoluted process can also do multiplication and division and even find things like a square root. That is all done through a series of amazing and intricate mechanical movements. Catherine likely had access to one of these to help her step through the calculations and something else that she might have had would have been a log table. Working out big tables of logarithms and also trigonometry values was something that motivated us inventing computers in the first place to make calculating these tables easier and ensure that there were less mistakes. Engineers around this time would have also used the slide rule, but I'm thinking that here these calculations need to be done to really a high degree of accuracy, maybe four or five decimal places at least, and so a slide rule might not be able to offer that kind of precision. But a log table, especially one made for engineers, can go right up to five, six, or seven significant figures. For the first example, the eastward launch, we have a given launch position and also a selected re-entry position. And we're going to do three orbits. These are the values that Catherine worked out using those equations on the previous page and using her first approximation. We can do a little recreation of this using the log table. Taking the first equation and the values we've been given it fills out to this. We can do the subtraction by hand, although the division and the multiplication is a bit harder. In the grand scheme of things though, this equation is pretty short and simple, so maybe she wouldn't have needed to use log tables for this, but we'll use them for the sake of illustration. A quick reminder about logarithms, if you have a thousand, that could be rewritten as 10 to the power of 3. So the log in base 10 of a thousand is 3. The log of 100 is 2. And the log of 10 is 1. For a log of base 10, it is rewriting your number as 10 to the power of something. And that something in the power is your logarithm. Converting our numbers into logarithms is useful because instead of dividing two numbers, you can just subtract their logarithms. And instead of multiplying two numbers, you can just add their logarithms. First, we want to find the log of 91.585. There are two significant figures before the decimal point. So we do 2 minus 1 is 1. So our number is going to start with 1 point something. To find the rest, we go to the table. This is a five place log table and we're looking for 91585. The first three digits are here. We come down to 915, then across to 8. Now the first two digits are missing off of this value, which says 180, and the first two digits are over here. They are 96. So our logarithm is 96180. But then because we had 91585, we also need to add a 2.5, giving us 961825. 
Doing the same thing for our other numbers, we end up with the three logarithms that we want. We want to add the logs of these two values since they're multiplied and subtract this one. That gives us 0 0.88610 but we're not at an answer, we're in a strange realm of logarithms and to get that to our final answer we need to take the anti-log of it. There's a table for that too. We are looking for 0 0.88610. 0 0.88611 That will be 7691 plus 2 7693 our decimal point will be placed between the 7 and the 6 to give us exactly the same answer that Katherine Johnson has recorded down here. Take 7.693 and feed it into here with our other known values and you'll get 32.162. Take the cosine of that, multiply it by the cosines of the latitudes plus the sines of the latitudes. Take the inverse cosine of this whole thing and then add on the angle at burnout, and you should get 51.89. And taking the sines, cosines, or inverse cosines can be done by looking it up in the table. For example, the sine of phi 2, our latitude, 34 degrees, would be 34 degrees, point zero. the sine is 0.55919. From these four expressions, you'll get your first approximations of these four values. But we are given a reference value of t of theta 1, so you can use that and the new value you've worked out for t theta 2e to go back and calculate a new value of this parameter. Feed that into these equations again and you'll get your second iteration. But also for that, use new values for your latitude and your longitude that are corrected for the ablateness of the Earth. Doing that whole process four times gives you this table of iterations. And because we've reached a point where we've got some kind of convergence to a value here, we can take these values and use them with our last two equations to work out the azimuth angle and the inclination angle. Going back to compare our results with that of the new IBM computer, it says that using the azimuth angle calculated by the method of this paper, an orbit was calculated by the computer for an oblate rotating Earth. And it's the trace of that resulting orbit that is presented in figure 5a. So this is actually what the computer has given us for what the orbit will look like. Doing it by hand, like in this paper, indicates that the selected position would be reached in 281.316 minutes. But the computer data indicates that at the same time, the satellite would be 18.6 nautical miles west of the desired position and wouldn't reach the desired position until 281.398 minutes, which is just a little bit later. So this agreement is considered good. Now we can do these things pretty much instantly. Here's some code on Mathematica, which generates a graphic where you can just move the slider and see how moving the azimuth angle will change the location of the satellite after however many orbits you like. When the big IBM computer was first used to calculate the trajectory of a flight, astronaut John Glenn actually asked if Katherine Johnson could verify the calculations so that he could feel confident going up. She reproduced some of the computer's calculations by hand to make sure it was doing the right thing. In the Hidden Figures movie, there's also a scene where the character who plays Katherine Johnson is talking about Euler's method. She says that they can use Euler's method to solve a problem about going from an elliptical orbit to a parabolic one. She runs off to the side and finds a book that she opens up to learn about the topic. And from that tiny screen grab, I did manage to find out which book that was. It's this one, The Mathematics of Physics and Chemistry by Marginal and Murphy. And here we can find the same page. It's about the modified Euler method. And this is about taking small iterative steps to solve a differential equation. We didn't have any differential equations in the paper that we just looked at, so this would have been used for different work entirely, likely having to do with actually trying to plot the path of the rocket, perhaps using the rocket equation, which is a differential equation. 
But I think that's enough for this video. Thank you for watching and a special shout out to today's Patreon Cat of the Day, June.